the very kind invitation um, to speak to you this evening. I thank you to Stacey and UCB for supporting um, this evening for um, families and individuals with, um, with epilepsy. Um, I'm not sure what your expectations are for tonight, um, but maybe you, you might let me know what you're hoping that I would cover. I, I thought I would discuss when medications don't work, the things that we need to consider. And, um, but if, do any of you want to give me, uh, just, um, it would help me to know what you're expecting you know, tonight that you'd like to learn about. Does anyone have, like to make any comment? <laughs> no? So I'm going to talk about you know, um, the ketogenic diet and surgery and other things and um, the vagus nerve stimulation. I'm going to talk about approved treatments. I'm going to talk I will address, I'm sure many of you want to know more about CBD, and I will talk a little bit about the evidence on CBD. Um, and uh, so essentially, I'm going to cover um, the current available options for treating epilepsy with emphasis on when medicines don't work. So I'm going to cover other medications, such as um, uh, investigational medicines, the ketogenic diet, and modifications of the ketogenic diet, and um, epilepsy surgery, and vagus nerve stimulation, and I'll talk a little bit about other types of stimulation that are in development because there's going to be a lot in that field in the future. And what is the best treatment for, for my epilepsy? The perfect treatment does not exist. It's, you know, we'd all like to have no seizures, no side effects, and they're really, while many people are, have seizures that are well controlled on medicines without side effects, we don't really have perfect treatment for many patients. Um, or individuals who have epilepsy. However, um, it's also really important to realise that there are many conditions that can look like epilepsy and are not epilepsy. And um, making the correct diagnosis is really important. And about 20% of individuals who are thought to have epilepsy that does not respond to medicine do not in fact have epilepsy. And um, that's when we look at patients that we admit to the hospital for a continuous EG monitoring to record their typical seizures, we find in fact that many of them don't have um, epileptic seizures. Some may have epilepsy and other events, but they, there often are events. So I think being sure that the diagnosis is correct, where the correct medication is used, where they, was the medication taken as prescribed. Most of us, physicians included, don't always take the medication as prescribed in the correct dose. And compliance is a, is a big issue across the board with all kinds of treatments. So I'm going to show you a couple of, just a couple of scenarios. This is a little girl who was referred to me a few years ago by a very experienced pediatrician. And she was five years old and totally normal. And she'd had four convulsions, four generalized tonic clonic seizures. Um, she, her pediatrician uh, did an EEG, which was normal, and at that time did a CT scan, subsequently did an MRI, which was normal. And she was tried first on Flobazem and then carbamazepine or Tegretol, and her seizures continued. And appropriately, her doctor referred her for an opinion that certainly we feel like any child who hasn't responded, or any adult who hasn't responded to anti-seizure medications at least should see a, a neurologist who has expertise in, in epilepsy. Very often in children, we like to see them sooner than that. But when I took the history, when I saw Sarah, um, I asked about the circumstances in which the seizures occurred. And all of her seizures occurred on exertion. So when she was running, and she was extremely pale during these seizures. So it turned out, in fact, I sent her straight for a cardiogram, and she had an irregularity of her heart called prolonged QT syndrome. And it's actually not that uncommon in, in uh, particularly in some of our Aboriginal or First Nations families, there's quite a lot of prolonged QT syndrome. And it can cause sudden death. Um, you can, and you can have a seizure if you have a cardiac irregularity. So she didn't, in fact, have epilepsy. And we stopped her carbamazepine, and she went on appropriate treatment for her arrhythmia. And in fact, several members of the family were screened. And they had prolonged QT. So hopefully, some lives were saved in that family. But not everything that looks like a seizure is um, epilepsy. Now in the United States they very often admit people to hospital to record events when um, they want to clarify the nature of these spells that a person is having. And this is a study from the Cleveland Clinic um, several years ago when they looked at children under the age of five who had events that looked like seizures. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the most common uh, things are little mannerisms, little ticks and mannerisms, or problems with sleep, like night terrors or awakenings from sleep that were not epileptic. Um, a condition called Sandifer where they, there's acid reflux and the ch children arch and stiffen and it can look like a seizure. For children who were between 5 and 12, the most common was um, <coughs> events like in ADHD, being very inattentive and not just kind of, you know, being daydreaming and not attending <coughs> and looking like an axons or a complex partial or focal seizure. Also um, spells from sleep. And then when we got into the teenage years, it was more likely to be stress-related events. So we call them psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. And they're more common in females from the teens and into early adulthood. So this is, this is an example of a young woman that um, I saw was referred down from, um, let's see this one. Um, she was referred down from one of the emergency departments in the interior. She had come in, she'd been having spells for a few months and she'd come to emerge and they thought she was having tonic clonic seizures. But in fact, these weren't epileptic. Her EG was completely normal throughout them. You know, I don't know if those of you who have witnessed full body convulsions, you don't usually see it like this. She's a little bit like a belly dancer. She, the movements are very irregular and, you know, up and down and side to side. And so these weren't epileptic events at all. These were non-psychogenic, non-epileptic events. It turned out there was a lot of stress in school and she was struggling, struggling in school and there was bullying. And we got um, a psychologist to see her and she didn't need any of her seizure meds that she was started on. So. Um, these type of events, they occur in individuals who have epilepsy and also in individuals who don't have epilepsy. They commonly begin in the teenage years and often there's stress. Often it, it may not be that conscious stress, but bullying, um, various kinds of trauma, um, and sometimes mood disorders like depression and anxiety <coughs> are seen. It's really important that we diagnose this correctly because the management of this is not continuing with multiple changes in your anti-seizure medication. It's dealing with the stress and dealing with uh, the bullying and dealing with the mood disorders. So I think you may think it sounds uh, silly, but uh, you know, uh, we know for certain uh, patients who were referred as possible as having possible epilepsy to a, first, a clinic where there's new onset, um, where, where new onset epilepsy has been seen, many of those patients do not have epilepsy. So um, it, it just is very important to make, the right di to make the right diagnosis. Now, in terms of medications for epilepsy, it's also really important that we choose medications that are appropriate for the type of seizure that you're having. So a child or an adult who has absence seizures or myoclonic jerks, myoclonic seizures, the treatment is different and, the, and some medicines can make those <coughs> seizures um, worse. We also have to be very vigilant about side effects and I know for certain a lot of a lot of doctors don't pay enough attention to side effects from patients uh, that patients describe and, and push medicine doses very high. We also want to avoid, if someone's overweight, we want to avoid a medicine that would cause them to gain more weight. Or if someone's really underweight or has anorexia, you want to avoid a medicine like topiramate <coughs> or topamax that could cause decreased, um, to decrease appetite. So we take a lot of things into consideration when we choose the medication. And also, it's very important to start with a low dose and go slowly. Um, sometimes if your child or adult are having a lot of seizures, we have, there's an urgency to get seizures under control. Um, but in general, the principle is to start with a low dose and increase the, the, um, increase the medication dose uh, gradually and try to use the lowest effective dose. Some patients uh, or individuals have seizures that respond to a very low dose of a medicine, whereas others may need a very high dose. We all metabolize or break down medications at a di different rate. So I could respond very differently than someone else to the same uh, dose of medication, even been of the same weight and everything else. So I think that, um, and probably many of you in the room have experience of a lot of side effects. And a lot, our meds do cause, can and do and can cause a lot of side effects. Blood levels are not very important. There's only one medicine where it's important to do blood levels, and we don't use that <coughs> medicine that often anymore in children anyway. It's phenytoin or dilantin. We do blood levels if we're worried about you know, perhaps the person's not getting the right, you've not been given their medication appropriately or not taking it. If we're worried about drug interactions, that's particularly in adults where they could be on drugs for diabetes and high blood pressure, and you're just concerned could there be an interaction with the medicines. If we're worried about side effects, we may also do blood levels. So um, a very important part in children is a lot of children with epilepsy, because it's a brain disorder, 
have whatever is causing the epilepsy can also cause problems with learning, behavior, and attention. And about 20% of individuals, and particularly children, who have epilepsy have attention deficit disorder. Most of them are not hyperactive, so they don't tend to cause behavior problems in class. They tend to be a bit more inattentive and harder to keep on track in, in school. So it's, it's very much underdiagnosed and undertreated. But there are certain medicines that we know can make behavior worse. So we have other options, and we, my practice is to try and avoid, if a child has a lot of behavior problems, to try and avoid medicines where we know there's a high risk of behavior. So medicines in the benzodiazepine family, like clobazam, Toparamate, levetiracetam, phenobarbital. Now, lots of patients tolerate all of these medications extremely well, but there are some individuals who are very, are very vulnerable. And we would try to avoid um, a medication that would make their behavior worse. And in fact, we have medications that often help behavior. So, lamotrigine, carbamazepine, valproic acid. Not in everybody, but they often are used to treat behavior um, problems. And um, so, if behavior is a big issue, principle is to try and avoid a drug that might work, might um, improve behavior and not make it worse. So in terms of, you know, I'm not going to go through all of the medicines, but the meds we use for absent seizures are different than the meds we use for focal or um, complex partial um, seizures. <clears throat> and in general, the, um, you know, for, for example, infantile spasms, I don't know if any of you in the audience have had a baby uh, with infantile spasms. That's a very, very difficult seizure disorder with hundreds of causes many times associated with abnormalities of brain development and function. Those, in, in those children we use vigabitrin and steroids, they're the first line treatments. And then there are other medication options or the ketogenic diet and occasionally uh, we perform um, surgery. Now this is a study that's quoted a lot and actually there's some recent data suggesting that in children the outlook is not as gloomy as this. But this was a, a, um, a study performed in a clinic in Glasgow where uh, adolescents and young adults and older adults, it was a new clinic for epilepsy. So they saw patients with their first seizure, but this is not young children. And they found that 47% of them responded to the first medication that was tried for their epilepsy, and then 13% responded to the second, and then 1% to the third. But actually, uh, th there's some recent data that's suggesting, and I, I would have to say that in clinical practice, it's not, I think we get a better response in children than we do in adults, you're less likely. But still, we have about 30% of adults and children where with the current medicines that we have available, they still have uncontrolled epilepsy. So it's still a huge problem. And all the newer medicines, unfortunately, we have great expectations that all the newer medicines on the market would have a better uh, result in treating this very difficult group who don't respond. But in fact, what, what's transpired really is that the newer medicines are better tolerated than the older ones like phenobarbital, but they haven't really made the dent into controlling that um, re treatment-resistant population that we had hoped. So there's still a, you know, a lot of, um, we need more and more new therapies, and t we need more precision therapies, therapies that will target the particular cause in um, in a particular child, and it's a ex it's a very exciting area at the moment because we're discovering there's over 800 genes associated with the development of epilepsy. Some of these are associated with the development of autism and intellectual disability, but some of these genes have specific uh, therapies. Some of which are conventional anti-seizure medications, and some of which are not. And I think this is going to be a really exciting area in the, the, um, in the upcoming years. We have a project at Children's, which I can tell you all about uh, later, where we're doing research on children with epilepsy of unknown cause and getting an answer in over 40% of them. And in some instances, it's having a direct uh, impact <coughs> on the choice of treatment for them. And I think there's going to be more and more uh, treatments like this in the future. Some of you may have family or know people who have cancer. Um, you know, such a, such a, a common uh, problem. But now in cancer, um, there are uh, tumors that have specific genetic markers that mean you can have a targeted treatment. So there's, in lung cancer, for example, where when I was training, there really were no specific treatments for, for lung cancer. But now you can have, if you have a particular gene abnormality or if you have breast cancer with a particular Herceptin gene or whatever, you can have a treatment that's targeting your disease that isn't just blunderbuss chemotherapy. 
So I think there's there's a lot of interesting um, things um, happening that hopefully will translate into better therapies for uh, people with epilepsy in the next few years. Other factors that impact whether seizures will be easy to control or not are if you have abnormal brain structure. So if the brain, you know, you have a malformation of brain development, or you have a scar from brain trauma, or you have an um, injury from any other any any other uh, condition, you're less likely to get complete seizure control. You, in some instances, you can over time, but you're much less likely than if the MRI was structurally normal. If the EEG is very abnormal, you're less likely to get complete seizure control. And then there are certain conditions, I say, for example, infantile spasms, um, children with multiple seizure types. This is a much more uh, difficult scenario. And also if there's intellectual disability. Now, you know, there are a few very long-term studies that look at patients 40 years out, you know, there, but there have been some recent studies looking at one from Scandinavia, looking at patients 40 years from the onset of the epilepsy, and many individuals who were thought to have seizures as children that would never come off medicines did eventually come off medications. So I think there are still many people who will eventually come off medications, even with very difficult controlled epilepsy in, um, in childhood. So what do we do if medicines don't work? So as I said, the first thing we want to be sure the diagnosis is correct, and then we look at alternative um, uh, other treatments. So the ones where we've got strong evidence are the ketogenic diet, uh, epilepsy surgery, and uh, vagus nerve stimulation. So the ketogenic diet, do any of you have children who have been, or adults who have been on the diet, ketogenic diet? Yeah, so you can, you can comment afterwards, but it's not, an easy, it's not an easy diet. There are some modifications of it that are a little bit more tolerated. For example, the Atkins diet, which you, lots of people go on the Atkins diet to lose weight or the low GI index diet. These are less strict than the classical ketogenic diet is a diet that's 90% fat. <coughs> so essentially it's extremely restricted in carbohydrates. And it's been known since for many, many, many um, hundreds of years that this ketogenic, that fasting can control seizures. But now there's you know lots of published data. Johns Hopkins, really, the, the team at Johns Hopkins um, published papers um, about 30 years ago and there became a whole resurgence of interest. It had fallen out of favour when medicines to treat epilepsy were developed. But now there most um, epilepsy, comprehensive epilepsy programs have a ketogenic diet as part of their program. But it's not easy. It's you know you have to calculate everything, you have to weigh out everything. There's a marked restriction of uh, carbs, so it's a little tricky for birthday parties and for other children and, you know, in terms of having treats. But there are families who manage it very successfully and there are children who are completely seizure-free seizure um, on the ketogenic diet. So the, the key person in the ketogenic diet program is the dietitian, having a really good dietitian. And lots of them are very creative now and there's a mother in Calgary, um, she and a friend, they had two children on the ketogenic diet quite a mild form of epilepsy, but they established this keto, keto kitchen. So they have lots of fat and they exchange recipes online. So it, 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 all of this sort of helps for the uh, treats and dealing with birthday parties and all of that. But um, you even have to take into consideration the carbohydrate content in tablets. So if your child's on a medicine that has, is in a liquid with sugar content or toothpaste, so it's really, I mean, it, it, is a, it is a big commitment and it's, and it's, uh, it's quite, quite difficult. So the classic diet is a ratio of um, 4 to 1, so 4 times fat um, uh, for, each cal for each calorie of uh, carbohydrate. And 90% of the calories come from fat. Sometimes you have to do fluid restriction. So it does help, at least 50% of patients will go on it. It doesn't, like everything, it doesn't help. It doesn't help um, everyone. And it does come um, with some... Uh, you know, side effects which I'll discuss. It's not natural. Lots of people think a diet must be natural, but and that diet that's 90% fat is not a natural uh, diet. We don't recommend it as a first line treatment for epilepsy. Um, because, uh, you know, as I say, there's 65, 70% chance we get you controlled with medicine. Um, but we certainly look at it if two or three appropriate medicines have been tried. There is one condition, um, it's a genetic condition called glucose transporter defect where there's a problem in the transport of glucose from the blood into the brain 
and that the treatment for that condition is the ketogenic diet. Uh, also, a condition called Dravet syndrome, which um, is associated with a very bad uh, form of epilepsy. Those children often do very well on the ketogenic diet. There's no really good predictors of who will respond. It's, it's easier to do it in a toddler than it is in an adolescent or an adult. But there are programs for, um, for adults who wish to go on a ketogenic diet. There isn't an adult program here in BC, but our uh, program, my colleague Dr. Ha and our dietitian are hoping to um, help develop an adult program. We have some of our children, when they graduate to the adults, we, 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 we end up keeping them at children's because we don't have anybody to manage them in the community. But we're hoping to help the adult program develop, um, develop a ketogenic diet program. So the benefits are in certain terms of seizure control. Many patients do come off their medicines or get, can come down very low on their doses or some do come off their medications. But in terms of side effects and complications, so low blood sugar, particularly when you're trying to get started on the diet, <coughs> contrary to what you might think with a high fat diet, individuals don't gain weight, they lose weight usually. Kidney stones can occur, so it's really important that we have adequate um, hydration. High cholesterol can happen and that sometimes, uh, it rarely needs, requires treatment and we have to give supplements because your calcium and some vitamins can become a little bit low on the diet. And I think the, side, the social impact, it's not, it's not an easy, uh, it's not an easy uh, thing for a family to embark on it's a, and it is the whole family, it's not you know, just um, the mum the mom and the child. Now are any of you familiar with epilepsy surgery or does it sound all very radical? <laughs> Yes, anybody? Yes, so, so we'll... So epilepsy surgery um, traditionally uh, traditionally was used when all medical therapy failed. But um, it's, not a, it's not a treatment of last resort. And um, in fact, surgery can cure uh, many people. It can result in complete seizure control, not in everybody, because nothing is successful in everybody. And now in childhood, um, you know, it's really important that we recognise children who will benefit from surgery as early as possible. It was first performed in 1886 in London, England, by Dr. Victor Horsley. And um, he operated on a young man who had had traumatic brain injury from an accident and had a scar, and they resected the scar. So, um, it was primarily performed in adults. In fact, I uh, went off to do my training after I was trained as a neurologist. I went to Boston and Children's to learn all about epilepsy surgery in children. And then I returned and we started a program together with the neurosurgeons at Children's. Um, and that's about 24 years ago. Because prior to that, we didn't have a program for children in BC. We sent um, children to Montreal or sometimes to the States. But what is known is that surgery is underutilized all over the world as a treatment for epilepsy. It does, you know, it does seem radical to operate on the brain and it does require a team who are appropriately trained. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what's uh, involved in uh, evaluating someone for epilepsy surgery. So the principle is that you want to identify the focus or a region of the brain where the seizures are coming from. And hopefully it's a safe area, and so it's important to look at the function of the brain. So you're trying to find the bad area that's causing the seizures and the good areas that control important brain functions. So, for example, the networks in your brain that are important for language, for speaking, and for understanding language. You would not want to operate in those uh, locations um, without being very, very careful to map out all of these important functions. And um, so it's really trying to spare regions of the brain where there are important functions. And also a big objective is to improve quality of life. So essentially, we're trying to work out the, all the, electric, the electrical pathways, the good pathways that um, are important for normal brain functions, and then the pathways that are important for, um, that are causing, causing the seizures. So you need to go to a program. We, here in BC, we have a program at the Vancouver General for adults, and um, we have a program at Children's. And we take a very careful, take detailed history, examine the child. The neuropsychologist does an assessment looking at the different functions of the brain. We do EEG recordings and try to record the typical seizures that the person is experiencing, their typical seizures. Good quality MRI. 
and then we can do this uh, with, with lots of very exciting ways of looking at the function of the brain, um, which I'll show you. Using, for example, we can use the MRI to tell us the pathways in the brain that are important for language and for controlling finger movements of our hands and for our visual system, among others. And essentially we're looking for everything to line up together and that doesn't always happen. And, and we have different types of surgery. We have surgery where we remove or disconnect so we can remove a small area in one lobe of the brain. Sometimes the process involves more than one lobe of the brain and it, it's what we call it multi-lobar. There are some children particularly who have diseases that affect one entire side of the brain. This is the most radical form of, you know, it's a very severe a uh, form of epilepsy due to an extensive disease that affects one side of the brain. Sometimes it's only removing, if you have a brain tumour and um, or an aneurysm, you just remove that lesion and, and you may remove a little bit of the tissue around it if it shows a lot of abnormal activity. Or sometimes we can remove just selective structures in the temporal lobe. Now, the surgery in the temporal lobe, um, has, it's the most commonly performed operation. And actually, Canada has been a leader in the world in epilepsy surgery. The Montreal Neurologic Institute, uh, where Dr. Um, Wilder and Penf what, uh, Dr. Wilder and Dr. Penfield, they were really pioneers internationally and trained uh, neurologists and neurosurgeons who went all over the world. So they they um, and now in 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 um, many countries we have uh, programs that are developed for children and adults. But the most experience is with temporal lobe um, surgery and the temporal lobe is here just by the uh, the ears and it's um, the, the kind of abnormalities that can cause it you can have a scar in that location or an abnormality of brain development um, a tumor um, sometimes there's more than more than one thing so I'll show you just um, give you a flavor of the kind of patients and and uh, so this is a young man who was 16 and a half when he was referred to me and he started to have seizures when he was 14 years of age. And um, with his seizures, he didn't have any warning, but he would um, stop what he was doing, become start to breathe very fast. You'll notice, I'm going to show you a video, but he does a little bit of lip smacking. Sometimes he would pick up things with his hands. We call those movements automatisms. And they'd last 10 to 45 seconds. He'd have a few per week. And about once a month, he would have a full body convulsion, a generalized tonic phonic seizure. And um, he, had, he had been tried on five medicines, they didn't work, he'd had some concussions and um, his neuropsychology um, was pretty good in terms of his IQ, he had no problems with his memory, he was a little bit impulsive, um, like many 16 year olds. And um, I'm going to show you uh, his seizure. I don't know if we could turn the um, light down a little bit. So, so he's, they're sitting talking about a movie and um, he suddenly stops, he's staring now, and you see he's breathing very fast, and he's rubbing his head, this is automatic, rubbing his head um, with his left hand, and he's got a little bit of lip smacking, I don't know if you can see that, um, you look at his lips, he's got a little bit of lip smacking and yawning, and they ask him a question and he doesn't respond, he just is not quite with them. It's quite short, it would be easy to miss it if you didn't know what you were looking for, this is um, a focal seizure, um, or a complex partial seizure, that means his awareness is altered. <clears throat> for those of you who are interested, there's a whole change happening in the terminology for seizures. We've just got used to the new terminology and they're bringing in further terminology, but I'll tell you about that later. And actually he's having, the technologist is sitting beside him and we're doing something, we're injecting a tracer into, um, this, he's having a, what's called a SPECT scan, and it's looking at the blood flow in his brain during uh, during um, this seizure. Okay, so he had one of the most common things. This is an MRI, and he had, this is a picture down through the brain. It's like you're looking at me here, and it's going right down through the middle of the brain. And this is the temporal lobe on the left side, and the temporal lobe on the right side. And he has a little scar in his temporal lobe. And this is the most common reason to have epilepsy surgery, with the most success. And, and um, the... Um, so he went on in 2006 to have um, this uh, temporal area resected. He's been seizure free and off medications and the pathology showed that he had scarring in that um, hippocampus of his, of his temporal lobe. So 
In terms of the outcomes following um, temporal lobe surgery, um, the best outcomes are when there's a scar on the temporal lobe, but if you look at many years out, 60 to 80 percent of individuals are seizure free. It's not 100 percent because there is nothing that's 100 percent really, I think, in any, in any condition that we deal, deal with. Serious complications are less than 5 percent. And um, what's known now is that earlier, doing surgery or earlier, there's a better outcome in terms of quality of life. Many adults are operated on with temporal lobe epilepsy who've had epilepsy for 20, 30 years. And they've lived with the effects of that. You know, it often affects their learning, their memory. Um, it affects um, <coughs> relationships. It affects getting a job. It affects driving. There's just so many things that it can impact. And so if, if we're trying nowadays to identify children who will benefit from surgery rather than waiting until they're 40 um, years of age. But there are still, in most countries in the world, there are individuals that are well into adult years with long-standing epilepsy who would benefit from um, epilepsy surgery. There's a lot of hesitancy to refer um, people for a workup for epilepsy surgery because operating on the brain seems such a radical um, thing to do. What is known in temporal lobe epilepsy, if you just continue to have uncontrolled seizures and continue on meds, just having no seizures causes your memory to not be as good. So over time, your memory gets worse. And it's thought that the uh, while surgery can have a negative impact on memory too, it some studies have shown that in fact you improve memory after surgery because you prevent that normal decline that occurs if you continue to have um, uncontrolled um, surgery or uncontrolled seizures. So another thing that's very important, um, you know, the quality of our investigations has gotten much better. You know, the MRI looks at brain structure. And I get many patients referred to me where the MRIs have been normal. But a lot of what you find on an MRI, what you look for and by asking the right questions, and then there are certain protocols. So we can find abnormalities now on MRI like this is a young girl that, um, I know you're not used to looking at MRIs, but she had several MRIs, including at our hospital, um, that were thought to be normal. And she was referred to me when she was about eight. She's now uh, started university. But she had frontal lobe seizures, and we, I, I got them to focus on her right frontal lobe. And here we find this little area of abnormal brain development that was missed on several previous MRIs because the... It, there are, you know, an MRI is just not an MRI. An MRI is used to, you won't miss a tumour um, because that, that's a big thing. But looking for more subtle abnormalities that can cause seizures, um, it needs to be looked at very carefully. And more often than not, it's the neurologist who will find these more subtle, the more subtle abnormalities um, on, on MRI. So the advances in MRI have made a huge difference in how we identify people who would benefit from epilepsy surgery. This is a pretty picture, it's called a SPECT scan. That young man that I showed you the video, the technologist was sitting beside, beside him and he was having a seizure and we, he had an intravenous line in his hand and we, uh, the technologist <coughs> injected uh, a tracer that was taken up by the region of the brain causing his seizure and it's not that easy to time it, you know, you have to be sitting by the bed and try to get the injection done within 10 seconds of the onset of the seizure. So it takes a lot of coordination and sometimes we don't manage to get that. But when you do get it and you can find the blood flow, it's a little bit like the EG except it's looking at blood flow uh, during a seizure. And this is a young man where the MRI was normal, but on the uh, SPECT we found an increase in activity and blood flow in his left frontal lobe and it turned out we did this other test called a MEG scan. We don't have, this is on our wish list in Vancouver, we don't have you know, access to, it's, it's called magnetoencephalography. The Hospital for Sick Children has invested a lot in, in magnetoencephalography there and um, they do it on all patients who've been evaluated for epilepsy surgery. But it's another non-invasive way, like um, with no risks really to pick up uh, the abnormal activity. And this boy had a, lots of spikes in that same region where the SPECT scan showed the blood flow. And he managed to have that little area resected without having to have um, and to be seizure free following it. So we have more and more techniques to allow us to, to find non-invasively uh, the part of the brain that's, that's triggering um, 
that's triggering the seizures. This is a PET scan. I don't know if any of you have heard of PET scans. They're used a lot now in, in BC. They're used a lot in cancer, for staging cancer, to look for if they're spread to the liver or to the brain or to other areas. But in epilepsy, um, PET scan looks at the metabolism um, of the, in the region of the brain. And the part of the brain that triggers a seizure, in between the seizures, the metabolism or blood flow is low. And during a seizure, it goes up. So the PET scan is another way of allowing us to look at the, um, at the brain uh, function. Now, functional MRI, this is where um, MRI, as I said to you, looks at brain structure, but functional MRI looks at brain function. So you're lying in the magnet, the MRI magnet, and so you can do repetitive, like tapping your fingers repetitively. And um, that will activate the part of your brain that's triggering the finger um, movements. Or you could be asked, um, Give me a list of uh, animals, you know, think of, generate a list of, of animals or some that will allow you to activate the language or uh, networks. Or we could shine a light in one visual field and look at the pathway for your, your, um, your visual field. If that information from the left side goes back to the right part, right, the back of the brain on the right side. So we can look at a lot of brain functions. Now obviously you have to be able to lie still in a magnet to do this. So not every, like a child who um, with a mental age less than six or seven could not do that. You know, you have to be able to lie still. There are things we can do if, for somebody who can't lie still. You can move the fingers that will activate the part for the hand, but you can't, there's nothing you can do um, for language. So this is an example of, um, is this very technical for you? Is it too technical? Yeah, it is a bit technical. I thought, I thought it would be nice for you to learn a little bit more about the kind of things we can do. So this is a boy, I follow him, he's now in his 20s, but I, 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 have, I have transitioned into adults. But he had a brain tumour causing a very normal, intelligent boy. And he had a benign brain tumour and it was removed. And you see here, there's a little area where it was removed. But his seizures came back and it looked like on his MRI that there was still a little bit of tumour left. But we were very worried because it was very close to his hand area. But here is yellow. So this is looking down at the middle of his head. This is looking at it like slicing off part of your skull and looking into your brain. But essentially, here he's tapping the fingers of his right hand. And we're seeing the yellow is the activation. And what was really good, it was in front of where his tumour was. So he was able to have that little piece of the tumour that was left removed without causing him any damage to his hand. So he, he had no deficit, like no paralysis after, um, after surgery. So all of these tools, these are all relatively new tools that we, um, and at Children's we have access to these tools for, um, for uh, evaluating um, children and adolescents for epilepsy surgery. I'm going to show you another, um, this is a young boy that um, his seizures, he would get a tingling in his left foot. So you'll see he's sleeping and then he sort of grab his left foot and his whole body goes very stiff and he calls out to his mom. He's completely aware during this. It's not a full body convulsion. But, um, and he's just going to start now. You see, he grabs. There, he's Polish, so they're speaking Polish. Um, And then he, he's quite stiff and jerky, but he's actually completely conscious. This is not um, a full body, uh, even though it looks, it's mainly the left side of his body that's stiff and jerky. And he's talking to his mum through all of this. Um, yeah, so, yes, his mum says to him, where are you? They're, they came from another province to us. But, and he said, BC, where else? He was completely, he was completely, um, completely aware <laughs> during, his, during his seizure. But this is looking at his brain. So he had had several MRIs. He had been tried on, when he came to me, he was having up to 100 seizures a day. So he really couldn't function. And he had 10 medicines. And his neurologist, he had many MRIs in Manitoba, which were normal. But we, here he's having a functional MRI. So this one, you're looking down on his head here. So this is his right side of his brain, the left side of his brain. And we know that the part that controls our foot is very close to the middle of the head. 
So we found a tiny little area, you won't, there's a tiny little area here that's fuzzy, and it turned out he had abnormal development in that area that's, that controls the feeling in his foot on the left side. So the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. So we found the area that was controlling his, um, causing a little area of abnormal development, and this is doing, we got him to do finger tapping, so this is his left hand, his right hand, and then we actually got him to move, wiggle his toes, and it activated his foot area, which was really kind of cool. And it was in this in this location where his abnormality was. And this is what the brain looks like. I don't know if any of you've seen. The, this is what it looks like when the surgeon opens up to um, to uh, evaluate it. And his the area causing his seizures was in here, and um, his seizures came from one just one electrode uh, at his foot area. Here, this little one little area. This we do EG recordings directly from from the brain surface, and he went on to have um, removal of this area before the surgery. His foot was weak because he was having well, number one, he was having up to a hundred seizures a day. After the surgery, his foot was weak, but he was able to walk, and he'll not be a, a you know a long distance athlete because the part of the brain that was causing his seizures was the part controlling his foot, and he and his mum elected to have surgery to try and stop the seizures because there weren't many options and many options left. Now I'm going to show you, this is a very interesting girl that we saw, uh, Dr. Shimri to, is um, with us as well. She looked after this young girl as well. But this was a very bright teenager and her seizures, she, her seizures were, she couldn't understand, you'd say something to her and she just couldn't understand what was said to her. So she, and then she'd stare off a little bit, but she it basically was trouble understanding language and um, failed several medications and her MRI, it looked like she had a tumour, this is actually the left side um, of, her, of her brain, but we were worried that her seizures came from the part of her brain where for understanding speech. So she had an MRI performed and this is, these areas, the yellow is um, when she's talking, this is more expression of speech. And most of us have language in the left side of her brain. And the, um, the, this yellow here is, is uh, expression, and back here is reception, understanding of speech. But it is, in, in any event, the, her li there's her little lesion, her tumour, is in here. But we know it's surrounded by really important parts, like for understanding language. So we were really, really worried about surgery, you know, causing her to have trouble being like a stroke really after surgery but on the other hand she had a tumour so it was really important to try and and, and control her, her surgery. This is what it looked like in the operating room but she had surgery awake and we recorded her, e her brainwave activity from there and here's where she's awake, she's actually awake, it's quite amazing, we don't often do this um, in children, it's done, it's done a lot in adults actually especially with tumours that are close to important areas but it turned out this is her tumour, and but the areas for her speech were, they weren't exactly in the tumour. So it was very successful for the surgeon to remove it and not cause any problem with her speech. So it's, it's and it turned out it's a very low grade tumour or a benign tumour and she's been seizure free since surgery. So th this shows you the complexity of working out uh, when seizures are near speech. Annabelle. Sorry to, um, to interrupt, but um, you talk about scar tissue causing yes. um, seizures, how do you avoid the scar tissue? Yeah, it's a very good question. I know that's a very, very good question. And, and all most parents and, and individuals ask that. But the, uh, that, the scar tissue from a surgery can cause seizures, but it's a very, very rare thing for, the, for that to induce a seizure. But a scar from a brain trauma, like we saw someone today who had quite a major skiing accident and had trauma to the frontal lobe, that can commonly cause uh, cause epilepsy, but it's not that common that scarring from an operation, it's, um, a brain operation, triggers new onset uh, seizures. Yeah. Do a lot of the people that have the scar tissue are they unaware of the injury that actually caused it to be yes, there? Yes, many are. So yes. it's not necessarily something you're like that was a big accident. Oh no, like, no, not necessarily. Not but no, more often than not, there's been concussion. Yeah. And obviously, it's more likely with a motor vehicle accident or you know, a skiing accident or a cycling accident where you come up and you've concussed and you have bleeding. Like I had someone in the last year, a girl with that, a, a form of epilepsy that should be easy to control, but she um, had missed her meds and she had a convulsion at the top of the stairs at school and then got 
bleeding in her brain, you know, she and she's ended up with you know some scarring and damage from falling, you know, falling in a seizure. You know, so it's, it's kind of complicated. So we we do like to see we do like to try and prevent concussions, you know, and brain injuries because they're an added an added thing. But this essentially, and this is the tiny little. This is was where um, this is the EG recording directly from the brain surface, and then this is where the surgery was um, was performed. And so far, so so far so good. She has no evidence of any tumor and no evidence of any seizures, and is doing very well. She's still on her seizure medicine, but it's not more than it's not a year yet since her surgery. Now, the most radical surgery is surgery where we disconnect. You may there are some children in the interior who've had this, but where you disconnect one whole side of the brain. It's called a hemispheric uh, hemispherectomy. It's a really radical operation and all these people function with one side. But it's always done for procedures. It's very successful, but it's always done for diseases that involve one whole side of the brain. So they're very, very serious diseases that usually start in infants. And, and um, <coughs> essentially, we, we call it a disconnection. We don't remove the entire... Years ago, they used to just remove the entire hemisphere, so you had like big cavity on one side that just would fill up with fluid. But nowadays, they disconnect, and um, this is looking again down through the middle of the brain, and they disconnect this area to make a window, and then from within the, the spinal fluid space, they disconnect the rest of the brain, and they, there's a connection between the two sides that is cut. And this is what it looks like in a real part, in a real child. That essentially, it's they, a bit like that previous diagram where they make a window and then um, and then disconnect. So it's done for diseases like this. You can see this is a little baby with a condition where uh, called Sturge Weber syndrome and the whole one side of the brain is very small and compared to the other and there's uh, a lot of calcium and it's very abnormal. Or in a disease like this where one side of the brain is very overgrown and very abnormal. So this is a, an example of a little baby who um, a little baby who um, I think she started to have seizures when she was in the room, actually. And, um, so what, what you're going to see now is she stiffens up, her whole body goes stiff, and she makes a little moaning sound, and her eyes are over to the side. And then she goes into infantile spasms. I'll show you, for those of you who are not familiar with infantile spasms, it's a type of seizure we see in little babies. At this time, she's stiff and jerking and her eyes are blinking. It's very distressing. You know, her mum thought two weeks before delivery she noticed these events several times per day. And I saw her on the, the baby on the first day of life. Beautiful, perfect looking little baby actually. And and, uh, and you see, um, in three months we had tried nine medicines. And we could not stop her her um, procedures with medication. And now you'll see the spasms. And then these little spasms could go on for half an hour, 45 minutes. And, and so these are very look they look very innocuous, really. The spasms are so. Uh, So, um, you know, it was a very tough decision. We found that she had an abnormality of development on her left side of her brain that was quite extensive. And she, um, initially, when she was three months of age, she had uh, part of the left frontal lobe uh, removed, but she still had some seizures, so the marked improvement. And then at six months, she had a disconnection. Now, that's, you know, 18 years ago, and, and I still follow her. She's had no seizures, actually, she's followed up 18 years now. She's, she's been off medications for many, many, many years. She has, you know, she's weak on one side of her body, so she has cerebral palsy, and she has learning problems, and, you know, she, she would have had all of these problems with just medical management because the seizures involved that whole side of, came from that whole side of, of her brain. So this is the most radical type of surgery. It's not common. In, in BC, we have less than 40 children who've had this. And um, I think the oldest individual in BC who had this operation is probably now in... 60s. There are some adults that are still uh, um, around, but it's a very big, it's a really, really very, very big operation. And another operation that we do sometimes, it's more for, and there are several uh, young people in the, this region too who've had it, it's a procedure where we, um, it's called dividing the corpus callosum, which is a connection between the two sides of the brain. And it's mainly done for seizures where you fall. And in this, you're going to see a girl, she suddenly, without warning, just goes like stiff and down, you know, 
So this is called a tonic seizure or um, a tonic being stiffening. These seizures cause you to fall to the ground, so you're just walking along and you just go crashing to the ground. These are very, very difficult and often they're seen in association with other types of seizures. And um, we have a couple of procedures that are very effective in treating this, but it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a procedure that's geared towards um, with the objective of stopping all seizures. But these kind of seizures are usually seen in the context of multiple other, um, other types of seizures. Now, vagus nerve stimulation, I don't know if any of you in the audience are familiar with this. It's a little bit like a pacemaker. It was first approved in the US in 1997 and in Canada in 1998. And it's a little device um, that is placed, um, our first, the first child we had, we sent to the States for that in, um, um, just after it was approved in the United States, before it was approved in Canada. And it, this is, these are the various, there's different uh, models. They're, they've been getting a little bit smaller and they're placed in here, I'll show you in a, in a patient. This um, is silastic wire and it hooks up with the vagus nerve in the neck. And then this little wire is tunneled under the skin. So I'll show you, this is where the connection is in the neck to the vagus nerve. And it, the surgeons usually do it along one of the creases, the natural creases in our neck. And then the uh, stimulator, um, the little battery is in underneath here, the device is in underneath the muscle and skin here, um, just um, on the left side. And this is an example of one of our teenage girls, you know, she's wearing a little tank top. And you can see the, I think you can see it a little bit, the, the lead that's tunneled under her skin, but it's pretty, cosmetically it's pretty good, you know, and she could still wear little tops that didn't, and it, you didn't really see um, the stimulator. This is again, it's not a treatment to cure epilepsy. And there are, some, there are some patients who do really well, and I've had a few patients become seizure free with it, but mostly it uh, is um, used to reduce seizure severity um, improve quality of life and as I said it's not a treatment that commonly will uh, result in complete uh, seizure control. We program it to be on, initially it's on for 30 seconds and on for 3 minutes round the clock and then there's a little magnet that you can use so there's much smaller now you can carry it on your person but you, if you have an aura so if you're an adult or an older child with an aura you can just activate it and it can sometimes stop the seizure, it doesn't, doesn't do that for everybody um, the, the caregiver can also, when they see a seizure, can also activate it. So with, there's a new form of it that's just been um, released and we're hoping to start using it, where it picks up the seizure before there's any clinical signs of the seizure. It picks up many seizures that are associated with a rapid heart rate. So it will pick up the change in the heart rate before you see a seizure. It's called responsive stimulation. So I think that's going to be a, um, a good uh, tool. There's lots and lots of new developments in the whole field of brain stimulation. So in terms of the uh, efficacy, it, re it helps about half of the patients who are implanted. Most patients do not come off medicines with this. So sometimes you can lower the doses a little bit, but many, a, lot of the, a lot of improvement in quality of life for many um, of the patients. Um, it can be used for any uh, seizure type. So to summarize, uh, in patients where seizures do not respond to conventional anti-seizure medications, we need to make sure the diagnosis was correct, that the appropriate medicines were used, that they were used as prescribed, that we've ruled out non-epileptic seizures. Then we look to see whether the ketogenic diet, vagus nerve stimulation, um, <coughs> surgery are options. And I think um, as a patient or a parent uh, or a caregiver or someone, or a spouse or whatever, I think asking your physician to refer you to a neurologist who has an, who has, who is an expert on epilepsy is really important. I think it's important that you see someone who really knows um, uh, what they're doing and is really uh, expert on epilepsy. And also to ask about other options. A lot, there is a real hesitancy among some physicians to refer patients. In our centre, we're trying to have it that any child who's not responded to two medicines sees one of the neurologists who has extra training in epilepsy. That's we're trying to bring that in at, um, as a standard. We still have a huge need for new therapies because we still, despite everything, there's still a lot of patients who continue to have um, uncontrolled um, epilepsy. And, um, you know, so it's, we still have lots and lots of um, research to do to improve the lives um, of our patients. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention.